Hello, everybody. And this is the advisor with Stacey Chalemi. And I'm here today with Coach Ellie Young. And she is an amazing person. She deals with lots of different issues. And she works with a lot of women to help them with different types of issues. Today, she wants to focus on what's happening in perimenopause. How can you control it, recognize it, and how can you get through it? And, you know, today she has a lot of great information, a lot of great advice and tips and little hacks that you could do to help your body and to help you live a happy, healthy, productive life going through perimenopause because it could be very tough, especially when you don't even realize you're actually in it. So Ellie, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do and tell everybody about, you know, perimenopause and, and what to expect, how to get through it and what we could do to help ourselves. Sure. So um, I'm an alcohol-free life coach and hormone balancing expert. And again, that just kind of follows my own personal journey. I was 39 when I gave up alcohol and um, then I was experienced such great health benefits but I also recognized things were just kind of changing my body. And I was, you know, going into my forties and um, I started going into the science of hormone balancing because I was just, everything was changing. All the things I used to do weren't working anymore. And perimenopause also started having kind of a big moment in the media. A lot of big brands started getting behind the marketing and there's lots of products and supplements and diet and nutrition. There's just a ton of information like flooding the market right now. Um, and so I help my clients really trim through all that noise and really simplify what hormone balancing really means and understanding how to be proactive in perimenopause. Um, so perimenopause starts as young as 35. Um, it's essentially the 10 to 15 years before menopause. So a lot of people are like, can I go get tested to find out if I'm in menopause? I mean, perimenopause. And you can, you, but again, these, these tests of your hormones are really kind of just like a drop of data in this big sea of data, right? And so you really can tell you're in it mostly just by symptoms. Um, and perimenopause is essentially marked by just a drop in your progesterone. So I have a great graphic here for those watching on YouTube here. So this is like your age right, right here. The 40s, right about here, you can see there's just a big drop in your progesterone. This is estrogen. Estrogen declines much at a slower rate until your 50s where it stops. And that's when menopause happens. Menopause is marked by you actually haven't had a period in 12 months. So a lot of times in these later stages of perimenopause, you'll have like a period and then you'll go three months and then you'll have another period and then maybe go six months. And so it slowly just kind of tapers off. Um, but this period right here, when progesterone is dropping, that's what creates estrogen dominance. And so that's where we start to suffer is when this ratio has that big gap because estrogen and progesterone were kind of designed to work with each other. They're supposed to stay kind of in this healthy ratio to balance one another. That's where the term hormone balancing comes because estrogen keeps us really um, vivacious. It's, it keeps us feminine. It gives us energy, creativity. It keeps us really juicy as a woman, right? And progesterone is kind of the calming, neutralizing hormone that balances that out so that we don't kind of go over the top. And so a lot of the symptoms um, that you will experience in perimenopause can be attributed to too much estrogen and too little progesterone. So it's called estrogen dominance, but it's essentially you have, you don't have enough progesterone to balance those two out. Right. I know for me that I, I, I started going through uh, perimenopause at 39. I had no clue that I was going through perimenopause. I just, you know, all of a sudden I started feeling really fatigued and that fatigue started to increase and increase to the point where I didn't, I didn't even have enough energy to get out of bed. And then I noticed like mood swings. I noticed that, you know, I was like all over the board where, you know, and, and my patience level was going completely down, you know, and I just, you know, I was, you know, my periods were lasting a much longer. I was bleeding for maybe two weeks instead of a couple of days. I was getting, you know, maybe five times more blood 
than I normally got. They were like leaking through my pants, you know, it was like, oh my God, you know, what the hell is going on? Yeah. And I just, you know, that's when I went to a functional medicine doctor and they did a thorough blood work on me. And, um, you know, they did, they checked everything, you know, for vitamins deficiencies all the way into, you know, all the different hormones and stuff like that. And my, my testosterone and my progesterone were barely nothing. It was like 0.05, you know, I had normal estrogen, but the other two were like, I had hardly any production of it left. And that's what was causing everything to get thrown off for me. But it was a terrible feeling. I didn't even know what was going on. I just knew that I did not feel my, the same way I did. And it was a horrible feeling to feel. Yeah, it's, and these symptoms that we're, we're all experiencing, a lot of us aren't going to the doctor and are just accepting it as like, well, I guess this is just what happens when you get older. You know, a lot of times they're just like, well, that's it. You know, your hormones are going to go crazy. You know, the characterization of a woman in this phase of life is not great. Like, it's like, she's going crazy. She's taking pills. She's drinking wine. She can fly off the handle at any moment. She's weepy. She's sad. She's gaining weight. It's... Mm -hmm. It sucks. And I, I really, that's part of my mission here is one to kind of rewrite that script and tell women like one, you don't have to experience this. You can take control back over this yeah. phase of your life and you can actually thrive. Yes, we are going to age, but we can minimize the suffering that is hormone decline and it can be done pretty naturally. Like I, I fully recommend like at some point, yes, go to the doctor because you can't supplement enough nutrition or enough like healthy herbs and things like that to produce enough estrogen and progesterone. So at some point, yes, go see the doctor and get hormone replacement therapy. But up until that point, you can do a lot naturally just with your lifestyle and just with your nutrition. Um, I see most of the, the clients that come to me are complaining about the same symptoms you are. Oftentimes they're still drinking. If mm -hmm. I can get them to take a break from the alcohol, they'll see it like 75% of their symptoms improve because yeah. alcohol is really impacting two major players that are going to impact your sex hormones. So they, the alcohol is going to impact your sleep drastically, and it's going to impact your cortisol levels because it's messing up your sleep. It's jacking up your cortisol, which in turn <laughs> fireworks when I go mm -hmm. like this. Um, and so after it jacks up your cortisol, your, your blood sugar goes up because it thinks you're in fight or flight mode, which then raises your insulin. And then it stores that excess sugar as fat. So we gain weight as a result of this lack of sleep, high cortisol kind of recipe. Also yeah. when our stress levels are really high, it kills our progesterone, um, when the, there's a saying, when cortisol is high or stress is high, progesterone is shy. And so again, that is going to further exacerbate that estrogen dominance gap, which is so that is responsible for the heavy periods, the lack of sleep, the mood swings, the rage, the breakouts, um, the insomnia. And so we really need to go to the top. When we talk about hormone balancing, it's people just assume it's like your estrogen and your progesterone. It's really going higher than that in this hormone hierarchy. I have a great picture here of the hormone hierarchy. And um, it's about working on these three hormones at the top. So oxytocin, cortisol, and insulin. Cortisol being the one people are most familiar with and the one you really have a lot of it, like, control over surprisingly you think oh my life is so so stressful but two major ways you can manage your stress better is to get really good sleep and to cut out alcohol they will work together to help lower your cortisol so significantly that you will see improvements in your pms in your overall hormone balance so that's right. one of the first kind of strategies in my kind of overview of hormone balancing for people. It's the first thing I'm going to ask you is like, what are your sleep habits like and how much are you drinking? Yeah. 
And drinking isn't really good also because, you know, I was told also that it cuts off the oxygen in the vaginal canal. So, you know, everything down below, like the, the more alcohol you consume, the less oxygen, it cuts it off and then you develop other problems. And mm -hmm. so, you know, alcohol not only, you know, does other things to you, but it also causes extra problems because it's cutting off the oxygen supply. Every time you drink, it's cutting off the oxygen supply. So you're not getting as much oxygen down, down below, and you need that oxygen. You need that oxygen for many reasons, you know, down below in order for your, 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 your vaginal canal to function in order for everything to be sensitive in order to have a good a love life, everything, you know, and, and that's why some women experience painful sex too, is, you know, if you're drinking and you're cutting off oxygen and you're going through menopause or perimenopause and you're starting to like, you know, your estrogen level is, is getting lower. And, you know, a lot of women experience painful sex and that could be very disturbing because who, you know, who wants to try to do something that's joyful and it's going to be painful you know, you're not getting satisfaction from it, you know, so it, 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 you don't want to do it. And that's why a lot of women, you know, tend not to want to do it, you know, and that's why a lot of women go to lubrication to try to help themselves because it gets drier down there. Yeah. Um, I know there's an estrogen supplement that you can actually insert that, that helps with that. There's lots of great products out there that help with that, but yeah, vaginal dryness is definitely a symptom of perimenopause and menopause, unfortunately. Um, yeah. In addition, alcohol, it also is raising your estrogen. So it's raising your cortisol, raising your insulin, raising your estrogen. And that is a function of the liver not being able to detox excess estrogen in your body. So the liver is in charge of detoxing all of the toxins in our body. But when you're drinking alcohol, it prioritizes alcohol because that is toxin number one. So it actually can't detox the remaining toxins in your bloodstream. And so, and your, you know, everything. So all that stuff gets reabsorbed, estrogen being one of them, creating more of that estrogen dominance, additionally increasing your, your risk of cancer. So it is it like out of one of the best things you can do, if you're like listening to this and you're like, oh my gosh, I know something's changing in my body and I know I need to like work on this. Let's work on cutting that alcohol. Okay. You will see drastic improvements in mm -hmm. your sleep, in your stress levels. And then mm -hmm. once you get a little bit of like success under your belt, you're going to feel so much better that you're going to be like, okay, now I'm ready to try more things to, to kind of take this power back in my health and start being more intentional about my nutrition, my movement, my stress management. Those are the next kind of main um, pieces I, that I would put in this priority. I put sleep, number one, cutting alcohol, nutrition, movement, and stress management. And of course, people might people be like, like, of course, you know, duh, yeah, I need to work on my diet and I need to exercise. But when you're coming from a different place, because for most women, when we think about dieting and exercise, it's always about like, I need to be skinny. My whole mm -hmm. life, I've been trying to be skinny. I've been trying to be something I'm not. I'm trying to shame my body and diet and punish myself with exercise. And it's never been enough, right? For most of us, it's just never been enough. We're never satisfied. We're constantly at odds with our bodies. Yeah. One, because we've, we're trying to hit unrealistic goals. Two, right. because we're not actually listening to what our body needs. So yeah. that's why this is such a different approach. I love it. It feels like a love language. It feels like I am not dieting. I am nourishing my body. And I am paying attention to what my hormones should be doing. So if you're right. still a cycling woman and you're watching here on YouTube, this is your hormonal cycle. This is what the hormones are supposed to be doing. The two I'll be talking about the most today are estrogen and progesterone. So estrogen is the pink. In the beginning mm -hmm. of the cycle, most of the hormones are flat. And then as you enter that ovulation window, and most people think ovulation is just this one smack day, right? When you can get pregnant. It's actually a window of time when your estrogen starts to peak and actually all the hormones peak at the same time. Your testosterone creates desire during this window. And there's also a little blip of um, progesterone. So during this time um, is when we're going to experience 
a lot of craving because estrogen makes you more sensitive to dopamine. And that makes evolutionary sense, right? Because we need to be receptive to pleasure. We need to be um, trying to procreate, right? But what this window also makes us very receptive to is all types of pleasure. So it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be risky behavior. Um, I love to talk to my clients about this because you can often track bad choices back to an ovulation window because all our hormones are peaking. It actually makes us feel really good. And that pleasure seeking kind of like receptivity is also makes us kind of pursue things that might not be great for us. So when I, when I, you know, I've studied addiction quite a bit, this is a window where people tend to relapse. Additionally, in the late part of our cycle, when the hormones start to drop, this is, you know, what people would call the PMS window, the time during before your um, period. When we are experiencing lows during this time, that's another time people are really vulnerable to Um, self-medicating. And again, so you can see just how important hormones are, how much they control our mental health, Estrogen alone is responsible for 400, over 400 different jobs in our bodies. So this idea that we're not, we're just supposed to let things happen in perimenopause and remember when like our hormones just start to go away when they are so necessary for all these different functions in our body, especially just to feel good. Um, Mm -hmm. No, like you need to learn how to nourish and we need to pay attention to supporting them so that like we can thrive. And so that's something I teach in my um, balance challenge. And so um, depending on when this airs, if you guys are listening, I am um, doing a balance challenge, which is a month of me coaching you through cycle syncing, which is essentially paying attention to what your hormones should be doing and how do we nourish ourselves in each of these different phases? Because as the hormones are at different levels, we thrive with different conditions, different nutrition, different exercise intensity levels, different lifestyle, different like social activity. Um, And when you are in sync with your body, when you're actually like letting your hormones kind of dictate how you function in the world and you're nourishing those, you all of a sudden start to like feel really, really good. And you're not like, you know, normally in this phase, my, uh, the back half of my cycle, when I would be feeling like I'd be progesterone here is peaking in yeah. the it's called the late luteal phase. Progesterone is responsible for actually calming you. Right. And, and it's supposed to offset that's the estrogen. So they peak in tandem, but in perimenopause, if we're not producing enough of the progesterone, that is down below the estrogen making you estrogen dominant. That is where PMS happens. So we Mm -hmm. focus on nourishing progesterone right here, which means more carbohydrates, more rest. Like we said in the beginning, when when stress is high, progesterone is shy. So we try to minimize as much stress here. Progesterone also needs glucose to thrive, to actually, your body needs glucose to make progesterone. So that's why our blood sugar is naturally higher here, you crave more carbohydrate. And so what I coach my clients here is to eat nature's carbs. Don't eat a bunch of pizza. Don't eat a bunch of French fries. Although I am the first to say I am guilty. I am guilty of that. I am human. But if you, the more awareness you have and you try to say, you know, I'm going to make myself some sweet potatoes. I'm going to give myself some squash or some butternut squash, things like that. You are going to feel so much better and you can minimize all of that PMS. Like I love to brag that ever since I started cycle syncing and I've been doing this for close to two years now, I would say it took me three years to really get it right. Three years, I'm sorry, three months. All of a sudden, all my symptoms started going away. Like I used to have really sore boobs before my period all the time to the point where like I hurt to exercise. I was just like, oh, I'm a runner. And I was like, I can't go running. My boobs hurt too much. Um, And I would often have like a rage day, a day when I would like lose it. Like whoever was in my path, it it didn't matter who it was just somebody would just tip me over the edge and I would absolutely lose my mind. Um, I used to put an R on my calendar. I'd be like, R, this is probably when you're going to rage out on somebody. So watch it. I would try and like warn my husband. Um, And that stopped too. And I, I'm, I'm as shocked as you are that like 
did I just really do this with food? And the answer is yes. And I'm not really strict. I'm not about counting calories or macros and things like that. I really focus on just a couple key metrics and then cycling my nutrition a little bit differently in this phase. Yeah, I, I break it actually into five different phases and you do things a little bit differently in each phase. And what's great about it is that you're never in one phase so long that it feels unattainable. It's not like right. you're going to eat low carb in perpetuity. It's like, yeah. no, you're going to just do it for like this little 10 day window. We're going to try and reduce our carbohydrate, maybe try keto style. So you're going to up your healthy fats, add yeah. in a lot of cruciferous veggies. So that's an ideal diet when you're building estrogen because estrogen really loves healthy fats. It loves, yeah. um, it doesn't, it can tolerate stress. So that's why you can, it, um, intensify your workouts a little bit more. Estrogen is also great for strength training. So right when your estrogen is peaking during ovulation, this is a great window of time for strength training. Um, So all of these little tips and tricks, and when you start just one, creating awareness of them, and then like kind of phasically going in and out of these different styles, your body starts to just say, thank you. Thank you. You're finally listening to me instead of just like, punishing me consistently with diet, exercise, alcohol, bad right. sleep, you know, and then anytime we felt bad, instead of being like, oh, I should take care of you. It's like, no, just push harder, have more caffeine and just push, push through it. Right. So this mm-hmm. is a totally different, like revolutionary, I want to say, um, like way of taking care of women in this decade of life. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's it's a great way. If if you could if you could change your diet and balance your hormones, that is phenomenal because most women don't even know where to begin when it comes to that. Right. You know, don't know, you know, how to balance their hormones, you know, what foods do I eat? You know, what foods will change my hormones? What foods will, you know, what foods will help me bring up my 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 um progesterone or what foods are gonna make me bring up my testosterone level, you know, how can I balance my estrogen level, you know? And then, yeah. you know, once you start going into like the menopause stage, it gets even worse. So you really have to try to focus as soon as you notice those symptoms, you have to do something about it. But like as you said before. I can't tell you how many of my girlfriends knew that something was going on. They they were experiencing symptoms. They were experiencing even hot flashes and they just, they just dealt with it for whatever reason. They didn't do any, they didn't get help and they didn't do anything to change it. They just dealt with it to the point and to went to the point where they were deep into menopause and then they finally did something about it, but it, they spent a good 10 years, you know, you know, just going through the motions, you know, between the time of perimenopause to the time where it was so bad, you know, they would turn bright red. We'd sit at, at, you know, having dinner and then, you know, their faces would look like pumpkins and you'd see them going like this. And, you know, it took took them years to actually get help. They didn't do anything during perimenopause. And I see that all the time with women, but why put yourself through that misery? As soon as I started in the changes, I, I went and got help because I, yeah. I saw it, it was just getting worse and worse and worse. Like you just, you know, each week I just noticed it was just, you know, it was starting to increase and increase and increase. So, you know, even when I went to the doctor, I had no clue when the doctor said you're in perimenopause, like my mouth opened up. I was like, huh? You know? And yeah. I was like, I, I didn't, I didn't even realize that you can have perimenopause at 39 because like my mother was still have was still spotting at 58, you know? So yeah. wow. she, didn't go, she didn't go through perimenopause until later in life. She was in her forties, I think, when she started going through perimenopause. So I just assumed I was probably going to be like her and I, you know, and I wasn't. And like I was telling you before, you know, everyone's history is different. And like, because my grandmother passed away, at an early age and because she my family comes from another country I did not know their medical history so mm-hmm. I probably do take after my father's side but I have no clue what my father's side consists of because I don't have the medical history and I guarantee you a lot of women out there don't know their their medical history that well and they just notice these symptoms and they just don't know what it is totally and you know as much as yes, there is a hereditary component to when you will go through menopause, perimenopause, our 
our the toxicity in our environments is such that it's messing with our home runs so significantly that right. it could really happen at any time. And yeah. that's, I mean, that's good and bad. I mean, it's good in the sense that you can clean up your, the, your toxic exposure quite a bit. It can feel overwhelming, but if you start really small and you just start working on the nutrition and say, okay, I'm really going to eliminate as many toxins in my food supply. And yeah. to be honest, like I've always considered myself a really healthy person. I've always been in pursuit of like wellness. And, but it, again, it was more under the, this, uh, you know, always just trying to be skinny. I was like, what foods are going to make me have a flat stomach or low carbohydrate. And so I ate a lot of bad things along the way, a lot of chemical things like sucralose and sugar alcohols and, you know, low fat products and low sugar products, always mm -hmm. being marketed to, to be skinny instead yeah. of being like nutritionally good for me. I had no connection between food and actually what my body nutritionally needed, or yeah. even that my cycle meant that I should have a little bit different. I should be eating a little bit different throughout that. Um, yeah. And so one thing I do support my my clients with in the balance challenges, I actually pr provide these little food guides here about nourishing progesterone. I have a list of foods to add and then nourishing estrogen as well. Yeah, so I help my clients create um, food sample food plates for all the different phases. So it's like, okay, when you're in your menstrual phase, here is like a, a visual of like how you want to build your food plate. Like these are the vegetables you want to include that are specific to detoxing estrogen or boosting estrogen. And then here are the like healthy fats that estrogen loves. So we, it's really, it becomes quite simple and it becomes, it's just coming from a different type of motivation. Again, you're not trying to be skinny. You're not sitting here counting calories or portion size. It's literally just like, oh, this is going to help my hormone, which is going to impact everything else in my wellness, in my health trajectory. And so it's like you're killing so many birds with one stone just by focusing on eating for your hormones. And right. it's, a, it's just a game changer for women because it really, we all have very complicated relationships with food in our bodies and it's largely unhealthy. Um, yeah. So this is like, just a really a breath of fresh air as far as like nourishing yourself. And it's coming so much more from a place of like self care instead yes. of like, instead of just punishing, you know, like, Oh, I don't like what I see. So I'm going to starve you. I'm going to work you out really, really hard. This is like, Oh, my body needs this. And this is, yeah. I'm going to feed you like a baby. You know, we think about how intentional we are with the food we feed our baby, how like, Oh my gosh, we're looking for everything organic has to be the cleanest products, has to be toxin-free. And we're trying to get them a whole variety of vegetables. And then at some point we stop doing that for ourselves. And we're just yeah. like, I'm going to eat as little as possible or as just like, I'm only going to eat salads because I want to be as skinny as possible, right? Um, and that we have just been depriving ourselves of so much nutrients. Um, yeah. It's no wonder we have so many issues going on with our health. Because our, yeah. our cells, our cells are nutritionally starving, right? That's why we're hungry all the time. That's why we crave the bad food because our we're not getting what we need to build to build this beautiful body that we need. It's like that's why that that's what craving comes from. Is it's like they're not getting the micronutrients they need to build these things. So we right. have to like feed feed ourselves so they can build the beautiful bodies we're meant to be living in. Oh yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Because, you know, nowadays, if you look at, there are so many foods that we think are healthy, but they are so unhealthy. You know, you, you have to really look at the labels. I always say, you know, be so cautious of what you buy because a lot, most of the marketing, you know, in today's society, especially in America is so manipulative and, you know, like you'll have like for eggs, they'll say, um, no added hormones. So it says no yeah. added hormones. You think automatically there's no hormones in it if you read it quickly, but that means right. that it hormones, it just doesn't have any extra hormones in it. So, yeah. you know, like that. And when you do see a lot of sugar-free foods, you know, that you, they have to compensate with other, you know, toxic ingredients for the sugar that they're not yeah. putting in that would taste okay. And so, you know, people are thinking, oh, it's sugar-free, that's healthy, you know, but then yeah. they're 
chemicals in that food because they're compensating for the sugar that they took out. So, you know, there's so many things, you know, and they put arsenic in the chickens to make it look more plump, you know, and then these are all of the things that we're digesting in our bodies and all the toxins that are building up in our bodies. And of course, they're going to affect our hormones. They're going to affect everything in our body, you know, yeah. and they can't, I'm, I was just, I'm recently reading a book called Toxic Superfoods, you know, all, there's so many things on the market, you know, with the, you know, where they say, you know, super power, superfood powders and superfood this, and, you know, all this other, and a lot of these foods that they push, you know, that they say is healthy for you. And yes, it is a superfood, but if you do too much of it, it actually could be really toxic to the body and people don't get that. People think, oh, you know, I'm going to have a protein drink and I'm going to put X, Y, and Z in it every single day, you know, mm -hmm. and then up and it's actually more toxic to the body and it actually can change the hormones because it wasn't meant to you know consistently be put in your body maybe every once in a while but not every single day and and the word superfoods has been you know marketed to the extreme where people don't understand the concept of superfoods they just think it everything that says superfoods on it is great when it you know it actually can be have the adverse effect on you sure i i'm I am a, such a sucker to having been marketed to all the healthy stuff back in the day. And I'm much more of a um, like educated consumer now, as far as reading labels. And that's one of the main tactics is to try and eliminate as many toxins in the food you're eating. And so the, the way to do this, the main thing you want to focus on is nutritionally, I, there's five things and it's like, okay, you want to get adequate protein, but the protein has to be hormone free, wild, wild caught, right? If it's fish, um, organic, right? Yeah. Fiber, you want to make sure you're getting a minimum of 25 grams of fiber a day. Oh, back to protein, you want to be hitting it's a gram per pound of ideal body weight. Mm -hmm. And so whatever you want to weigh, use that as your number. So um, if you want to be 10 pounds lighter, use that as your ideal um, body weight. And then that's how many grams of protein you should be trying to get. And that's hard to do. Um, yeah. You usually need to supplement with like a protein shake. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of women aren't getting adequate protein. And one of the, that will keep you feeling full. It's, it's an important one. If you're not getting enough protein, you're going to be feeling full. I mean, not full and you're going to want, you're going to crave and you're going to put in those empty calories, right? Where you're, again, your cells are like, we wanted more protein. We didn't want chips. We didn't want salty snacks and chocolate and candy. We wanted the protein, but all right, I guess we're trying to build a body out of sugar now. Um, yeah. So the next one is fiber. You want to make sure you're getting adequate fiber, 25 grams minimum a day, Um this should be pretty easy to do if you're um, eating like, you know, cruciferous veggies, um, you, you build them in. So a lot of times protein shakes have them as well. Um, you can supplement with something called psyllium fiber, which again, is also going to help create um, feelings of fullness. So yeah. focusing, and then the next one is fats. When you have adequate protein, fiber, and fats, you feel satiated and you're not going to crave as much um, junk. And that's just, that's just a gut trick, right? We layer our gut with lots of probiotic fiber. It creates like a mesh. It slows the absorption of blood sugar. So that when you do have a carbohydrate or like, let's say like some little dessert at the end of your meal, it's not going to raise your blood sugar as much. So there's yeah. a whole science to this. And once you kind of learn it, it does, it, maybe it seems overwhelming at first, but then when you, it starts to get really, really clean and simple. And that's really what I, I work on in the balance challenge is like, I daily, I put out videos every day during this challenge inside the course where I'm like, okay, guys, I'm in my menstrual phase. This is how I'm eating. This is what my plate of food looks like. And these are the things I'm really hitting right now. And like, I, you want to try and hit, you're like going to hit my protein, my fats and my fiber. And then bonus is like your antioxidants. And that is the stuff that's going to help your body detox and reduce inflammation. So that's going to be coming from your veggies and your fruit as well. And then yes. you also want to hit your probiotics. So again, also being hit, probiotics are also created from fiber. Um, so it's, it's really quite simple once you get into it. And then when you're eating it, like motivated in this way, it, it's so much easier. It doesn't feel like you're depriving yourself. It feels like you're nourishing yourself. It feels like you're, you're making choices 
to support rather than focusing on what you can't have all the time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's an excellent, excellent, you know, idea, you know, to, to give people it because a lot of times, you know, that's what happens if you don't, you don't, if you're not full enough, you'll find yourself munching throughout the day. You'll find yeah. yourself you know, snacking. But if you do give yourself a little protein shake in the, you know, either in the morning or the afternoon, and even if you start to get hungry in between meals, there's no reason why you can't create a small protein drink for yourself, you know, maybe put a little fiber in it. Like when I make my protein drinks, I put everything in it, you know, like, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, and I always put, I always put a little bit of fiber in my protein drinks along with my yeah. protein, you know? And so it, it does, it keeps me full for a while, you know, and I don't have that craving to want to eat, you know? So for the, for the next couple hours, I'm fine, you know, yeah. you know, so it, it, that's definitely a, a great way, you know, to, um, you know, keep yourself, you know, to a point where you're getting enough of protein and you're also, you know, not putting as many calories into your body, you know, and, yeah. you know, best way, you know, like, um, I always say to people, if you're, if you're not sure if, uh, if a food is healthy or not, when you're in the food store, if you can't say the word, then obviously the item is not healthy, you know? So it's, you know, if you can pronunciate everything in the ingredients, then it's good. If you can't yeah. pronounce the ingredients, then obviously there's a problem there. Yeah, exactly. You know, and speaking of cravings, um, I'll kind of go into the science of why we gain weight in perimenopause and menopause. And it's, I like to call it the perfect storm of things going on in your body. So most women say that they're hungrier, mm -hmm. that they have more intense cravings, and they also are starting to move less. Fat gets redistributed to the abdomen from your hips and thighs, which makes mm -hmm. the appearance of more weight gain, maybe if, even if the scale hasn't changed. Um, yeah. And then also you're, you're getting really poor sleep. And so here's kind of an explanation hormonally of what is going on. So basically when estrogen starts to slowly decline as it does in perimenopause and menopause, um, that impacts two of the hunger hormones. So ghrelin is a, ho a hormone produced by the stomach and it is it stimulates hunger. It makes you feel like you're hungry. Um, yeah. So our ghrelin goes up when estrogen declines. Additionally, leptin is the hormone that actually makes you feel full and that declines. So we are hungrier and feeling less full as a result of our estrogen declining. And we're like, what? I mean, that fact alone right there is like, women are like, okay, give me my estrogen, sign me up. I'm ready. Cause I don't want to be hungry and not feeling full. That's why we feel ravenous sometimes at yeah. this, at this stage of life. Additionally, it affects one more and it's called neuropeptide Y, and it actually increases this one. And that is another appetite stimulant. So we've got all these things working against us that essentially are making us hungrier, less able to feel full. Um, it also, I, I forgot about this one too. It also impacts our oxytocin. So oxytocin, if we remember, is at the top of the hormone hierarchy. I'm missing my slide. Oh, here we go. It's another one that sits at the top, impacting the release of the other ones. Um, and when we have when we have a lot of oxytocin, when you're snuggling a loved one or a, a pet, it actually makes your hunger go down. But unfortunately, when estrogen declines, we make less oxytocin. It's like, yeah. dang, can we get a break? Like estrogen is so critical. It's so important. Um, yeah. And so I, I want to be... Um, really clear here about estrogen because it can get kind of confusing for people because they're like, okay, our estrogen's declining. We understand that that's happening in, in perimenopause and menopause. It's slowly starting to go away. But then we talk about estrogen dominance. We don't want estrogen dominance. So people are like, wait, do I want to raise my estrogen or do I want to lower my estrogen? And so there is kind of estrogen can break down into two different directions. And so that's yeah. why they talk about like the good estrogen or the bad estrogen. So when we are consuming the, the right things for our diet, the cruciferous veggies, the healthy fats, the, the lean organic proteins and stuff, we make good progesterone that doesn't need to be detoxed for our body. It functions as good progesterone, um, I'm sorry, good estrogen. And it also inhibits cell growth. 
So um, that's good. We don't want cells to be proliferating in our body. When we're consuming the bad things like the bad seed oils, alcohol, um, all of the toxic products that have chemicals, hormones, pesticides, microplastics, perfumes, fragrances, all of these, they're called hormone disruptors that raises your estrogen. But what it does is it breaks down into a metabolite that promotes cell growth. So cancer cells, right? Eight out of 10 breast cancers are hormone receptor positive, meaning they need estrogen to grow. So that's yeah. why you see this link between estrogen and cancer. It's not all estrogen. It's you're not the, the foods on this list that I recommend to eat to boost your estrogen are not going to lead to cancer. They are going to help you make the good estrogen. They are also going to aid in the detox of the bad estrogen in your body. And so that can get a little tricky for people like, oh, it says that this food will raise my bad, you know, bad estrogen in your body. And it's like, that's, that's why one, we really need to support liver detox, but yeah. we do need estrogen. We need the good, healthy estrogen to pro perform all these functions in our body that keep us young, that keep us vivacious um, yeah. as, as women. I didn't really know that there was a good estrogen versus bad estrogen. I thought it was just estrogen is estrogen. And I didn't really think that there was a bad estrogen versus a good estrogen. Yeah, it's the way it metabolizes down. And so it go, it can go in two different directions. And that's a really kind of gray area for a lot of women in understanding. They're mm -hmm. like, wait, my estrogen's going away. Don't I want to raise my estrogen? And it's like the good kind. And again, it's really simple. It's really clean. It's like one of the best things for estrogen is cruciferous veggies. I always recommend to most of my clients, like try to eat two cruciferous veggies a day. Try to work in broccoli, cauliflower, kale, bok choy. Um, it's great fiber. It's filled with antioxidants that is going to support the detox. And mm -hmm. it also is just going to help you feel really full. So yeah. I keep, I keep a bags of cauliflower rice, like in my freezer all the time. And I mix it in everything. Even my kids, if I mix in regular rice with the cauliflower rice, they don't seem to notice and they'll eat it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I used to do that with um, some of my foods. Like I would grind it up to the point where they couldn't see it. I shredded up the, the, the veg, the vegetables, you know, yeah. and they, I would put it in regular food and I, I grinded it up so small that the kids had no idea that they were eating vegetables and the portions that they ate were enough for the, for the, for a healthy portion of the day, you yeah. know? So a lot of times, you know, you can just, if you're not a big veggie eater, if you mix it with other foods, you know, the same thing with adults, you know, I know adults mm -hmm. that don't like to eat vegetables, you know? So, but if you mix it in with something that you like, you probably won't even taste it. Yeah. You know, I was going to give um, everybody a little tip here too. If you're, if you're a mom who has to cook meals and for your kids and for your family, like I do um, a meal delivery kit. Um, I get two meals a week. I use green chef. They're great. They have a lot of organic meats and organic vegetables. Um, and what I do is I look at my cycle syncing calendar for the month yeah. and I color code it with my, this is something we do in the balance challenge. We color code all the different phases so, you what? know, oh, this is my ovulation phase. I'm going to be eating, according to your little cheat sheet here, <clears throat> nature's carbs. And I'm going to yeah. be wanting to work on these particular nutrients, right? And so then I'll look at the food kit menu and I'll be like, oh, cool. That's a good one for this week. That's a good one. And I'll, I'll schedule meal kits that sync up with my cycle, Um and with those meal kits too, I usually can modify them for the kids to, to also eat. They usually will always eat the protein, but I'll add in a little more carbohydrate for them with something. They have keto meals, they have paleo. Um, and then they have like what I, what I do for the vegetarian. I'll, when I'm on a more um, hormone feasting phase, which is when you're eating yeah. the na nature's carbohydrates, I'll pick the vegetarian meal because it has a lot more vegetables and then I'll add my own protein to it. So it's right. a good way to just get a lot of variety. Your hormones love variety too, lots of different vegetables. And so it becomes kind of like a game. I try to gamify it too. Another fun trick is to keep a list for the week and try to hit 30 different varieties of fruits, vegetables, spices, 
Um, I think that's it. Not grains. So nuts and seeds are included as well. So not yeah. protein. So you're, you, and just keep a list every, so it makes you get creative. You're like, oh, I need to add something new here. I'm going to add cilantro tonight. I'm going to add some parsley. And so the more variety, the happier and healthier your cells and body are. And it just makes it again, another way of thinking about food and connecting to it. Like, oh my gosh, my, my body loves this and needs this. My cells are like able to build things better yeah. because I'm giving it better ingredients, you know? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I love it. I love it. I, I think it's so important because I think, you know, and, and it's so funny when you're talking about gaining weight. I remember when I, I, um, what, I was, I'm actually in the, the menopause state, but I, um, I have my, my hormones are balanced, so I'm not really feeling the menopause, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing. I like one day I just went in the mirror and I had all this extra weight around my, my hip and stomach area. Now I really, I gained a few pounds but it never went away, but I don't know where it came from because I haven't done anything different than I mm -hmm. have done. You know, like I, it's like, I've stayed consistent over two decades. Like if you look at me, like in pictures and you go 10, 20 years, you'll see I'm pretty much the same weight, even though I've been trying to lose for like 20 years, I still yeah. as consistent in my weight, but it's like all of a sudden, like I put, you know, I didn't put on a hell of a lot, but it was enough for a five foot one chick to notice, yeah. you know, like, uh, yeah. it's like, you know, I guess, like you said, the weight just shifted, you know, and I did a couple extra pounds, but I was like, where did this come from? But, yeah. you know, at a certain age, my cortisol level rose and I've been trying to get that cortisol level to go down. And it's just, it's, it's, sometimes it could be a challenge for some women, you know, it just, you know, yeah. it was always normal. And then all of a sudden it rose and it's been very hard for me to get that cortisol level down. And with the extra weight, it's very hard to lose that extra weight too. your body sometimes because our metabolism changes, even though we try to eat, add foods to boost our metabolism, it's very challenging for women. Definitely. I think. Yeah. I, um, for a non cycling woman, what I recommend to balance hormones is to, is one of the best things to try is intermittent fasting. Um, one, cause it's, it's really going to reset your gut and it's really going to help train your body to learn how to metabolically switch. Um, and the better you get at that. So basically metabolic switching is like your body has two ways of creating energy and it can either get it from sugar or carbohydrate in your body, or it can get it from fat. And yeah. in our caveman days, we used to do this naturally, right? Cause you would have, they'd go long periods without food and then they would feast and then they would basically fast for, for several days, right? Um, so their body was really good at switching. We're not great at switching anymore. When we go without carbohydrate or sugar, we experience low blood sugar and like symptoms like headaches and fatigue yeah. and nauseous and we're snappy and biting at people. Um, mm -hmm. So we we introduce intermittent fasting and we, we ease you into it. We don't just say, you know, try to go 16 hours tomorrow without eating. We ease you into it. And one of the best ways to do that is to limit your carbohydrate in the night before or the day before. A lot of people don't want to do this because they think, well, I'm going to fast tomorrow. I'm not going to eat until noon. So I'm going to eat as much as I can at bedtime. You know, I'm going to have all the dessert. And it's like, all that's going to do is make your fast harder. It's going to yeah. spike your morning insulin and blood sugar, which creates more craving for that because it spikes it and then it crashes and then your body's like more more so yeah. we eliminate as much carbohydrate as we ease into a fast and then your body once it gets depleted it's like it runs out of glucose and it's looking around it's like okay it'll make you feel bad for a window and then eventually it goes all right we better find a new energy source and it'll yeah. start breaking down your fat for energy and this right. little mechanism for women in their in menopause years where who are struggling with the the weight gain and again estrogen is to blame for that it's it's really preventing you or the lack of it is per, it's hormonally preventing you from from having a leg up in this fight right um so go go get your hormone your estrogen replacement therapy from your doctor try intermittent fasting I keep getting the, the thumbs okay. up symbols here. And then um, and then we work on movement, building in movement. And again, this can seem overwhelming for people. It's like, I can't get to the gym. I can't get to a class. And it's like, you don't have to do a huge committed workout. If you can just build in 10 minute walks after yeah. every meal, you're going to offset 
your blood sugar by 30 to 40%, which is really the name of the game in menopause is managing that blood sugar, which is going to help you manage that weight gain. And it's going to just overall keep your energy levels higher because you're not going to be dealing with these um, sh blood sugar spikes and crashes where it really impacts your energy. Right. Exactly. I'm actually looking forward. I'm going to next month. I I'm going to red house, um, retreat in Utah and uh, Salt Lake city, Utah, and they will be doing intermediate fast in there. And so, yeah. I'll, so I'm looking forward to doing it. It's uh, it's going to be a retreat with a bunch of women. And so I'm look I'm looking forward to doing it because it's, you know, from, from, you know, I've, from my own experience, it's, it's a very renewing, um, it's very good for the body as you kind of reset the body, you know? So I'm really excited about that. And when you do do that at home, if you do it the right way, you do notice your body starts to feel better. It starts to feel yep. a lot better, you know? And I, I encourage that for people. If they could do, if they could just do it. And like you said, ease into it. Don't go like full speed ahead, but you know, with everything, you should just have gradual changes, you know, and, but if you could do it, it's a great experience. It really is. And, um, this is something I go deep on with my one-on-one -on -one clients because it is such a powerful healing tool and one of the best th mechanisms for weight loss as well, especially in this thing. And for p women who are cycling, there's only win certain windows when I recommend fasting. And that is really, really important. A lot of women who have had bad results with fasting, it's because they were doing it at the wrong times when they're not hormonally suited. In fact, it'll backfire. If you're trying to fast in the eight days before your period, it totally backfires on you because your progesterone that should be peaking, it needs glucose and it doesn't right. want stress. And, and fasting creates a little stress in the body because you're essentially you know, starving yourself and it's a yeah. good healthy stress. But you don't want to be do that when your body needs the progesterone. Um, yeah. When you're a non-cycling woman, you can work us, you can set up like a fasting schedule for yourself. And so one of the best ones, and I got this from Dr. Mindy Pell's Fast Like a Girl, is like the, it's three days on of intermittent fasting. On the fourth day, you do an extended fast. You try whatever your basic fast is, if maybe it's an intermittent one, which is 16 hours try to extend it to maybe like 18 or 20 hours or even 24, um, which sounds crazy if for someone who's never done it before, but it not only is it doable, it starts to feel so good and so healing and rejuvenating that you crave it. And you're like, oh, I want to do that again. And yeah. what's even better is after you've done a fast like that, you don't want to put crap in your body. It's really motivating. You are really much more intentional about the food that you put in your body after you've completely done cl cleaned out like that. Um, yeah. And then on that, so we do three days intermittent, one extended day fast. And then on the la the next day, you don't fast at all and you hormone feast and you get adequate protein and you really replenish and allow yourself to nourish all the, and again, this is training your body to metal, metabolically switch. You're in that fat burning mode while you're fasting. And then when you switch in and you give yourself lots of like nutrients and hormone feasting, you're yeah. just like nourishing your body and you're like, oh my gosh. I could totally do this. And I have, I actually have a client right now who is 59. She's lost 20 pounds. She gave up alcohol, which was a huge piece of it. So I think she's about eight weeks alcohol free now. And she's lost 20 pounds doing intermittent fasting. And, and she was already a very healthy eater. But once yeah. we started introducing this, it was like, she's waking up with so much energy. She feels so good. I'm, I'm like blown away by the progress she's made and her energy levels. Now she's like so excited and so happy. And it's at 59, which most women would be like, oh, I can't change much at 59. I am what I am. This is what it and right. Totally not true. You can completely change your relationship to food in your body at any age and start right. thriving. Oh, hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent with you. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you had to like really emphasize on some important factors, what are some of the things you'd like to emphasize on today? That you can be proactive in perimenopause. You don't have to wait until your symptoms get out of control in order to go get help. And that that help doesn't always mean having to go to a doctor, that you can do a lot of this holistically and naturally with food. And the main things we focus on, sleep, Sleep is priority number one and a very close, if not tied equal one is cutting alcohol. Cause that is going to impact your sleep so much. Um, yeah. Nutrition 
And again, the nutrition piece is not about dieting. It's about, it's about looking at what your hormones need and supporting those as you go through the different phases. And if you're a non-cycling woman, it's really focusing on, you know, managing your blood sugar. Um, next piece is movement, making movement a daily part, a non-negotiable part of your day and changing your mindset from like, I have to work out because I'm, because otherwise I'm going to get fat into like, I get to work out. I appreciate my body. I love my body. I love to move it and using movement as a way to offset blood sugar, really to, to say, oh, this is going to help lower my blood sugar, which is going to help reduce cravings, which is going to help me maintain a healthier weight and eat better all along the way. And then the last piece is stress management. So we all know how stressful lives are. We have to prioritize self-care and yeah. we have to, again, it's all kind of tied together. We have, you know, if we're, if we're staying up late at night and treating ourselves to a bottle of wine and Netflix as our form of self-care, yeah. it's backfiring on us. And oh, so yeah. we have to really rethink what real self-care is. And a lot of women maybe cringe when I hear them say, oh, let's, let's journal, let's meditate, let's do some breath work. But honestly, those simple practices can have huge, huge impacts. And again, it's really when you get intentional with them, it's about sending a message to your nervous system that says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to like, you know, I always say like, treat yourself the way you would a baby. A lot of us are moms. We spent so much time nourishing and caring for our children. And we didn't do any of that for ourselves. And so it's right. really about like, what do I need? How can I treat myself the way I would a newborn baby? Yeah, a hundred percent. And can you tell everybody some of the services that you provide? Yeah. So um, coming up in September, I have the balance challenge. So if you guys go to my website, findmyselffree.com, you will find the balance challenge and it's a one month program, but you get lifetime access to the course online where we learn, you learn all things, hormone balancing, perimenopause, menopause, how to cycle sync. And that's really what I focus on throughout the challenge is how do we track our cycle? How do we support ourselves nutritionally, exercise wise, lifestyle wise through these different phases? And you can honestly feel better. If you follow the program, you will experience major hormonal symptom relief within this 30 day window. Um, and in addition to that, you can sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if you're like, oh, I love this course, but I want more one-on-one -on -one attention. I want you to look at my hormonal picture and, you know, create a personalized plan just for me. You can add on my one-on-one -on -one coaching services. Um, and then additionally, if during the challenge, you're like, ooh, alcohol is like a bigger hiccup than I thought it was. A lot of people are like, cool, I can cut alcohol, no problem. And then they realize oh, it's a sneaky little bitch. It keeps trying to talk me into drinking. You're like, okay, this is, a, this is harder than I thought. And that's again, one-on-one -on -one coaching, or I have a brave course, which is similar to balance, but it's a, it's a course to help you kickstart the mindset of yeah. breaking up with booze where you're not relying on it for your relaxation, your joy, your connection. I love it. I love it. And what, tell everybody your website where they can find you. Sure. It's findmyselffree.com. And additionally, I have a podcast as well called Find Myself Free. And um, I want to offer your listeners, Stacey, I'm going to give you guys a discount code for those that are listening to join my balance challenge. Um, so I'm actually going to go create it right now. Should we have it be your name? Do we like that? What do we, or the advisor? Yeah, you could put the advisor. That's fine. Okay. All right. So if you type in the advisor on at checkout, it's going to give you 20% off my balance challenge. And so I'm just making a note here to, to go into my course and make sure I add that discount code because I would love to see your community there show up and um, start hormone balancing because it's a lot easier um, than it looks. And it's such a breath of fresh air when compared to traditional diets, detox resets that you've ever done. 
Yes. Oh, for sure. A hundred percent. Well, I'm very excited about that. I thank you so much. This has been amazing, Ellie. I love when you come on the show. I love all your information and I love how you holistically approach everything. And, you know, you don't have to resort to an over-the-counter drug or, you know, go to the doctor and get a medicine. You can actually use, you know, the natural components of food and different, you know, natural elements, you know, and to be able to balance your hormones because, you know, society doesn't make you think that way. So, you know, it's, it's so nice to realize because the power, you know, med you know, food for medicine, you know, pe people don't realize, but the body is, you know, you know, food is medicine. And if we eat the right way and our body absorbs it, we could actually improve many things about our health, how, how we feel, how our energy levels, you know, prevent an illness and so forth. So what you do is, is, is a wonderful thing. And I commend you on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacey. As always, it's a pleasure. I appreciate the time here. Uh, you're welcome. You have a great day. Thank you. See ya. Bye.